Good evening. Just to make it official uh, for our announcement for the special business meeting on um, <clears throat> the August 22nd in the evening, we'll be uh, voting and discussing Stephen Bahago using the parsonage, Suladico gift, and uh, how to pay for the labor for the roof. Uh, so keep that in mind, be praying about those things. Uh, we also did hear from Carrie. We wondered where she was this morning. Uh, she went to pick up Helen and Helen was feeling uh, not too good, so Carrie took her to the ER and uh, uh, possibly a heart problem. She's staying overnight to see what's going on. So uh, just pray for Helen. Also, uh, Sean told us in Sunday school that his dad had a heart procedure on Thursday and he's still basically in critical. He's in ICU, right? Yes. And uh, so we definitely need to pray for uh, Sean's dad. His name's Tom, Tom Blasha. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, uh, we just come before you this evening and we think of those that are in need uh, for help, for healing and, and health. We think of Tom Blasius and uh, we're thankful he had the surgery, but Lord, he's still in uh, ICU and, and critical. And so I just pray that um, he would be able to come out of that, just give his body healing. We think of Helen as well. And Lord, uh, as she's uh, spending the night for observation, Lord, help them to figure out what's wrong with her so they can help her. Uh, Lord, there's others that are have little nagging health issues. We think of Jim and recovering from his procedure and Nancy as well and uh, others, others, I'm sure, Lord. Uh, we think of Pete. We're just thankful that his bone marrow is 94% accepted and we just pray it could even be a hundred percent, Lord. Uh, so we'll continue to give him strength and healing and help. And uh, I'm sure there's other Lord, others, Lord, that I'm not thinking of. Uh, just guide and protect us each day. Help us to be witnesses for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Course on 552. I sing a new song. 552.
pressure's coming this time. There's a blessing in the offer, please. Dear Father, I just pray on the offer tonight and as we go into the lesson. In dear Jesus' name, amen. sing this last uh, hymn before the uh, message. 551, Joy Will Come in the Morning. We'll sing the first and the last, hymn 551. <laughs> But tonight's kind of uh, an interesting topic, subject. I have heard it talked about before and debated. And it's not something typically Baptists sort of get in uh, uh, a debate about. But I've had visitors come and they've sort of implied things uh, down this line. And I have been questioned. Definitely it's been talked about before in my history. So, uh <clears throat> As we get ready to go there tonight, it's actually going to be in Mark 6. Mark chapter 6.
as you're turning there, where is your hometown? Or what do you consider your hometown? Anybody want to share? Where's your hometown? Marlette. I knew that, Don. Marlette. You, you talk about somebody in Marlette. Oh, I went to high school with them. <laughs> she knows everybody. What did you say, Carrie? I said Marlette. You're Marlette, too? You're Marlette, too? Uh, anybody else? Silverwood. Silverwood. That's your hometown? It is now? Where where did you grow up as a little girl? In Missouri. In Missouri. Okay. Okay. My dad was a preacher, so it was all over. All over. I I I consider my hometown to be Vassar. I don't know if you've ever you drive through Vassar and pass through very very often. Occasionally I end up driving through Vassar. My grandma lives there, so I try to go out of my way occasionally and stop in and see her and it's changed some in the last 25, 30 years. It's changed a little bit, uh, but mostly it's still the same. You, you drive through there, it's like, oh, the budget lot has moved up to the top of the hill. I mean, little little things here and there have changed, uh, but most of it's the same. One thing, it seems smaller than I remember. Have you ever noticed that phenomenon? Things are smaller than when you were, remember when you were a child, everything seemed so much bigger. Uh, and every now and again, you go to a town or a little village or, or whatnot, and it's substantially changed. You know, there's bigger buildings or different buildings or maybe something totally torn down and there's a big parking lot. Uh, but sometimes it pretty much looks the same. And one thing about that is, uh, uh, when you go back to your hometown, the people are all still the same, typically. Even if the buildings are different or something's new, the people are still the same. I've actually been stopping by my barber. My grandpa took me to the barber for the first time in Vassar. Uh, his name's Paul. Uh, I, was, I was six years old. And I went there until I was 20 something. I didn't go there much in the last 15 or so years. But since I've been going to visit my grandma and stopping in, I've been, in fact, Paul cut my hair just the other day. And he is still the same, exactly the same. And it's just remarkable the, the conversations I can have with him. And, and we knew each other for so long, it's just, we clip and he is still the same. Buildings change, but people are the same. Well, Jesus, one time, went back to his hometown. Now his hometown's Nazareth. And he was a carpenter's son, and when he walked into town, he had some people with him, and people were probably, oh, Joseph and Mary's son's back. The carpenter's son's back. I wonder how long he's staying. I, I wonder what he's doing. And uh, people also started to talk. Well, I remember him. He was always that good boy that, you know, never had any problems or issues. And, and now I hear he's doing miracles. Now I hear there's these huge crowds following him wherever he, he goes. What kind of reception do you think Jesus received when he walked into his hometown? Well, let's look at Mark 6, and we're going to find out. We're going to see that Jesus is traveling and teaching. That's what he's been doing. He travels all over, crisscrossing all across Israel, and he ends up in his hometown and he teaches the people there, starting in verse 1. It says, Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? To these people that are looking at Jesus and hearing Jesus, you know how I just said buildings change but people don't? They're all looking at Jesus thinking he's different. I mean, he is not the young man that I used to know. They're essentially asking there, what happened to him? Look at verse 3. 
is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? That's kind of interesting. I think that they say that's the only place that he's referred to as the son of Mary. So a lot of different Bible scholars suggest that at this point, his earthly father, Joseph, must be deceased. Uh, is he not the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Joseph uh, Judah, uh, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Look at that little last phrase. What does your Bible say? They were offended by him. The people from the village of Nazareth couldn't comprehend how Jesus taught with such authority. How did this carpenter's son become so smart? What gave him the right to go around, you know, teaching us and telling us how we should live? In fact, who does he think he is? What, what gives him the right to say this and to say that? He's just Mary's son and his brothers and sisters. We know them. We live with them. People are actually offended by Jesus. Uh, maybe you're thinking, well, what did he teach that offended him so bad? Well, he taught what he taught everywhere he went. He taught to uh, obey God, to live by faith. He taught about the kingdom of God. And the people just didn't like what he had to say. His, his take, his interpretation on the Old Testament. Remember how when he talked about the kingdom and the coming kingdom, they thought, no, we want to wipe out the Romans and establish a kingdom here on earth. And he says, no, it's in the future. They didn't like that. And these people especially didn't like that. They were offended. Now, when you start to think about, go back to the Old Testament a little bit, you start to think about that, that makes sense. That people were offended by Jesus because don't, uh, didn't a lot of the prophets that went to Israel, didn't people get offended by them? People didn't like the prophets. They rejected the prophets. Uh, there was not good reactions from the people oftentimes. Like for instance, what happened to Jeremiah the prophet? Anybody remember? What happened to him when he came and preached? Anybody? Wasn't he thrown into like a cistern in the bottom of the jail and he was locked up there just for a really long time? I'm pretty sure that was Jeremiah. What about Isaiah? You remember Isaiah? What happened to him? The King James Version uh, in Hebrews 11 says he was sawn asunder. It doesn't say it was Isaiah. That's, it says one of the prophets was sawn asunder, cut in half. A lot of the scholars assume that they think they're talking about Isaiah. So we can go through all these different prophets. They weren't really received well. Many of them were killed, thrown in jail. And so it's no surprise that the people did not receive Jesus. Look at verse 4. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Uh, Jesus is sort of admitting there that he is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet, isn't he? What else was he? He was a prophet, priest, and king. But the people didn't want to believe it. Which brings us to the most misunderstood verse, within this Bible story, verse 5 and 6. It says, Now he could do no mighty work there. He couldn't do miracles there, except that he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. The misunderstood part of that verse is, is there at the beginning of verse 5 it says Jesus was not able to do miracles in Nazareth. Has anybody ever heard that discussed or talked about? Don, have you ever heard that, that talked about over the years? You have it? Well, just the idea that because he was so familiar with everything they do him better than they did him. Yeah. Anybody else? Have you ever heard that, that 
idea Jesus was unable to do miracles. Have you ever heard that talked about over the years? <laughs> I, like I say, it's not something I've heard about much, but every now and again, I hear about it from one particular angle. And we're going we're gonna to get into that right now. Uh, so, Jesus was unable to do miracles in Nazareth, except, it does say, except for a few healings. Now, some people say, well, you know, look at these verses. Jesus was unable to do miracles because of, of wholesale, because of widespread unbelief amongst the people. As if Jesus' power was somehow connected to the individual's faith. And if they didn't have much faith, it was like Jesus' power was throttled. And, and that's the way some people uh, want to interpret that passage. But is that what that means? Is that what that means? No. It can't be. It can't be that somehow Jesus' power is limited because we know Jesus has creative power. You remember the little boy who bought the brought the five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus made basket after basket after basket. He acts, what that was, was he was creating new loaves and new fishes. He has a creative power. I mean, these were fish that never swam around in the sea, never had any contaminations at all, never, they would have been the most tender, perfect meal ever. Can you imagine that? Fresh from the creator, never having lived a life, just it's brand new fish. I mean, that's the type of power Jesus has. It's creative power. In fact, he has all authority over nature. All authority. He could speak things into existence. Like if, if you had leprosy and your nose had fallen off or your fingers were just nubs, Jesus touched you and you had new fingers and a new nose. You were made perfect. Uh, that, is, that is all authority and, and all authority over nature. And uh, so these people's unbelief wasn't some kind of kryptonite to Jesus. It's not like Jesus is, oh, once, once this happens, I can't do anything. I, I'm, I'm totally useless. It's like, oh, my ability to perform miracles was reduced. I don't think that's what Mark is saying, even though that's some, how some people want to apply it. I think when we look at these verses that Jesus purposefully limited his miracles because most people were rejecting him. So uh, if you withhold a blessing, what kind of is that in a, in a roundabout way? If you withhold a blessing, it's a discipline or it's a judgment, right? So it's kind of a form of judgment. I'm not going to bless these people because uh, they don't even want me here. They don't believe me. And it's withholding a blessing. It wasn't that he couldn't do the miracles, but that he chose not to. He didn't want to because these people really didn't want him there. Therefore, only a few miracles happen. However, Whenever this passage is examined, the question always comes up, and I've heard this question before. Um, did so-and-so not get healed? And they're maybe talking about a friend of theirs, a family member of theirs, or a church person or whatever. Did so-and-so not get healed because they didn't have enough faith? You ever heard that question brought up? They, they didn't get healed because they didn't have enough faith faith as if healing is connected to our faith. You know, I, I didn't, must not have prayed for him hard enough. I must not have had enough faith. And the Bible says you ought to have faith of the size of a mustard seed. And, and I must not even add that as if healing, like I say, is dependent on our faith. And some people say, well, yes, it is. Look, and they go to these verses, Mark 6, verse 5 and 6. They say healing is contingent on our faith. And if healing doesn't come, then it's because of our lack of faith. And I, I've seen people make that point with this passage. I don't think this pa that's what this passage is saying. I've even met people that get really worried. Well, my loved one died, and it's my fault. 
because I didn't have enough faith. I, I think that the entire idea is, is a misappropriation of this passage. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Um, it's true, when we read the Gospels, it's true that Jesus moves and acts and responds to faith. Many of the miracles, right? Even when we're going through the book of Luke, there's mentions of uh, your faith has made you whole. He does this in the Gospels in response to faith. We're going to look at one verse here, uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9, as an example of this. Matthew 9, 29. This is about two blind men who are being healed. Matthew 9, 29 says, Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. So uh, there was this uh, healing in response to faith. And, and even the Apostle Paul, we can go over to the book of Acts. There's another place that lends itself kind of to this idea. Uh, Acts 14, verse 9 and 10 says this man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. He said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet and he leaped and walked. So there are instances where uh, healing is connected to the individual's faith. Um, so we can't say that sometimes they're not connected, but this is not true in all cases. Sometimes, and, and you're probably thinking of some of these instances in the life of Jesus, sometimes people are healed with no faith. There's no faith. He healed them. Sometimes there was very little faith. Right? Healing isn't always contingent on our faith. Now sometimes they are connected in the Bible, but they don't have to be. The truth is, right, healing can come from God, uh, or maybe it doesn't come from God, depending upon His plans, His will for our future. Now certainly, uh, I think you need to pray for healing. I mean, when we look at our church's prayer sheet, that has to be the number one request. All these people with health issues and, and people that need healing, certainly we can pray for people to get better, but God may have different plans for those individuals, plans that are different than what we think of. But I've met people that can't reconcile that in their heads. They, they can't reconcile, well, my faith versus God's sovereign plan. And, and I prayed for my son. I heard a lady tell me this one time. I prayed for my son, and God didn't change his behavior. And it, it must be because I didn't have enough faith. We tried to walk through this concept and, and, and look at some of these things. You know, uh, they're not, uh, uh, maybe God's plan and your faith wasn't necessarily overlapped or connected. Because God always has a plan and a purpose. And, and perhaps, instead of healing or helping or whatever, he's going to pour out grace. He's going to give you more grace to get you through that situation. For instance, Paul, did he have any uh, health issues that he prayed to get better? Yeah, right, we call it the thorn in the flesh, that's what he called it. Was that because he didn't have enough faith? Was Paul not a man of faith? Would anybody argue that, oh, well, the reason he didn't get healed there was because he didn't have enough faith? I mean, if we're going to make this connection in, in, to Mark 6, that, oh, healing and faith are, are intertwined, then we'd have to say, well, the reason Paul didn't get healed was he didn't have enough faith. Well, nobody would say that. It was he didn't get healed because God had a plan for Paul, and God was going to pour out his grace on Paul and bring him to uh, the, the character and the purpose that he, he wanted for Paul. So uh, we have to understand that uh, we can't just be dogmatic and say, oh, you didn't have enough faith. Because sometimes people are sick, sometimes 
people go trials and it's part of God's plan. He doesn't necessarily heal everyone every time. Right? People are going to die and then God gives those that are remaining the strength to go on. And, and uh, so if anybody takes these verses, Mark 6, 5 and 6, and they say, oh, you didn't get healed because you had enough faith, I don't think that is a correct interpretation of the passage. And uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to say, and it's slipping my mind. I, I can't even think of it. should have wrote it down. So any thoughts or questions, and give me a moment, I'll think of what else I was supposed to say uh, if you start talking for a second. I don't think it has anything to do with a mom. It has to do with that, did they have faith or not? Because I don't believe that there's any place in the Bible where someone had faith enough to go and see him that they weren't healed. I don't think you can quote any place in the Bible that that's the case. All the people that he healed had a certain amount of faith. If they didn't have faith in him, they wouldn't have gone to him in the first place. They had faith that he would take care of them. Does that transpire over time today? I don't think so, because Jesus is not physically present here. He doesn't come and touch us like he did during his ministry on earth. Mm -hmm. And I think what he's referring to in that whole passage of Scripture is laid out right from verse 1, where he says, they didn't really believe who he was. Who is this guy? We saw him grow up. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with that. That's why he only healed a few people. It had nothing to do why he didn't just massively do things. I don't think those people came to him because they saw him grow up. He just, you know, he's that carpenter guy. Why would you go to a carpenter when you need a doctor? Mm -hmm. I think that's what they're talking about. I don't think there's any place that it gives an indication that he doesn't heal because we don't have faith because almost every time throughout the Gospels where it talks about healing, there's several times where Jesus said you're healed because of your faith. Yeah. Yeah, and I totally agree with you because and it it's always disappointed me when I hear people that come to me, oh, I didn't have enough faith. And they look at this passage and, and we I tried to walk through it and teach them and one particular person I'm thinking of, they didn't, I don't know if they ever really grasped it. Well, I think God's, God's plan is greater than our faith. Yeah. Good point. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. The whole purpose for Judas being born, Yeah. he had a purpose. He right. was a negative person who became the son of perdition. That was his plan for his life. Those are the ones that I scratch my head about sometimes. Right. Because what's God's purpose for us when negative things happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the church in these days, the uh, uh, charismatic church, in fact, you know, you're not healed or things don't happen because you don't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. That just gets taught over and over. You know. Right. That And you triggered my thought. It's uh, some of those faith healers. They, they come to you and they say, well, your sore lower back, it's not healed because you must not have enough faith. And then that brings them in to sort of hook you in. Well, if you gave more money to the ministry, that would display more faith. And, and, and so I think there is, uh, some people are naive when they go to this passage, but I think some have an evil intent to twist it uh, for their own gain. Uh, when, and when, when really, we need to be looking at God's plan, like Lyle said. Yeah. Anything else? Any other thoughts? I didn't think we were going to have a real big problem with this passage. I, I think we've grown up with good, solid teaching. But uh, depending on the circles you get into, or uh, sometimes I've, I've seen people, for instance, you have the women's Bible study, Sometimes you invite other women in and you get somebody that's a little bit more charismatic leaning or somebody that watches the faith healers on TV and they'll start bringing in these suggestions that, oh, you just got to have a, a little bit of faith in a mustard seed and, and God's going to do this for you. And if he doesn't do this for you, it's because you didn't have enough faith. And, and really, uh, then we have to use discernment 
to realize, wait a second, God's plan is what's most important. We ultimately submit to his plan. And, and we did have faith. That's what I've said to Lyle. I've told people before. Um, I, I remember one person I said, you asking displays faith. You even talking that you're willing to talk to the creator of the universe and acknowledge that he exists by asking for this is enough faith. You know, it's not like, oh, if I just would have believed a little bit harder. Just asking is, is displays faith. And uh, um, so, yeah, we got to be careful how, how we interpret any passages. Anything else? Well, let's sing our last song, and then uh, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Nice, easy lesson tonight. Nothing too complicated. Maybe I'll trip you up one night. Oh, I never turned it on. <laughs> Let's stand and sing 505. 505, Lord and me. God is we need people and talk to people and and hopefully we're witnessing about your son and and we're talking about your love and grace and forgiveness and we're having these wonderful conversations with people Lord if somebody uh, inserts something incorrect Lord give us discernment Father not only do we need your spirit to give us discernment in regards to spiritual things but Lord when we're watching the news, when we're seeing things and, and hearing things and, and we're receiving all these bits and pieces of information, Lord, we need discernment in, in the world as well uh, in order to know what to do uh, for our homes and our families and our children and our, and our grandchildren and, and in our church, Lord, we need you to help us in that area. And Lord, especially when we uh, here's somebody that's uh, twisting the scriptures a little bit incorrectly or, or proposing something that isn't right. Lord, help us to see through that and, and give us the boldness to stand up and explain and, and, and walk them through a, a correct interpretations of the scripture. Lord, we're thankful for your son, what he did on the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name.